Hello, and you are listening to Eco Justice Radio on KPFK Los Angeles and KPFT Houston. A project of SoCal 350 Climate Action, our show presents environmental and climate stories from a social justice frame featuring voices not necessarily heard on mainstream media. Welcome, I am Jessica Aldridge. On today's show, Ethnobotany, Cultural Fire, and Indigenous Stewardship, host Carrie Kim will be interviewing Payum Kawish Elder Richard Bugby, instructor of Ethnobotany and Ethnoecology at Cuyamaca College through Kumeyaay Community College in San Diego County, California. Richard Bugby is Payum Kawish, otherwise known as Juaneño and Luiseño. Richard is the chair of the Board of Directors for the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival. He was the ethnobotanist for the traditional Indian health program through Riverside San Bernardino Indian Health, providing information on the interactions between traditional plant and pharmaceutical medicines. Richard teaches indigenous material cultures and traditional plant uses of Southern California, and his goal is to use knowledge to serve as a bridge that connects the wisdom of the elders with today's youth. Aloha, this is Carrie Kim. Listeners, mahalo for joining us today to discuss ethnobotany and ethnoecology, perspectives on cultural burning and traditional plant uses with ethnobotanist and ethnoecologist Richard Bugby of the Payompachom Nation, who is also connected with uh, various other tribal nations, including the Kumeyaay. We want to thank the Tongva ancestors for their enduring presence, legacy, and stewardship of this area. Our show comes to you from the ancestral lands of the Tongva, and we encourage all listeners to support Native First Nations wherever you live to help them continue their stewardship. Welcome, Richard. We are so honored to have you on the show tonight. Mew, mew. Yeah, it's good to be here. (laughs) Is there any Um, particular way you would like to open the interview? I can introduce myself in my language, I guess. Yes, please. Mew, um... Michishui, no tung i pakwishwaki ka tachi, no tung witchery bagriaka, no payankuish, no nakiapum, uh, hell hole canyon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Your entire life has been devoted to the study and teaching of traditional plant uses and indigenous material culture. Could you share why this became your life path? It actually started with my grandfather and my grandfather all my life never lived very far from me. He was always within a block or two from living from where I lived. Mm -hmm. Even when I got married, I I moved into a duplex and Mm -hmm. he had the other, other side. So, Oh, nice. And he used to take me off in these little adventures. He showed me how to make shelters and how to bows and arrows and how to, how to make bows and arrows and stuff like that. Mm. Not so much medicines and food so much, but more utilitarian type stuff. My, oh, my grandfather was a cowboy. Mm. And cowboys were kind of, with trucks, there wasn't much use for cowboys after trucks came along. <laughs> like, I move cows then. Mm-hmm. So he took me out to the, actually the desert a lot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and taught me a lot about plants and, and living out in the, nature i guess you would call it Mm -hmm. Um, i have a problem with calling it a wild because there's no in our languages there's no there's no such thing as wild no separation concept of wild our closest concept of wild is crazy Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah yeah, yeah, and and so that's the only thing we have is wild is is actually the same word as for crazy and even the word we do have a, uh, the Kumeyaay's do have a word for a while, but it's actually taken from, actually from Hebrew, I guess. Mm. It's called gentil. Mm-hmm. I think it comes from the word Gentile. Okay. But so we have no, no, no concept of wild. And, and well, it makes perfect sense because there's no separation. Whereas here we have, you know, 
incredible separation from nature. It's something outside of ourselves for the most part for Western. And you actually live in your house. Right. In the old days, you lived outside your house. You stored things in your house. You went in your house during rainy weather, but you lived outside. Right. You you know, you lived underneath a Ramada. You like that, though? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and it feels so much better when we do. I mean, I, I think of that from when I was down in the Amazon and, you know, it's like four walls open and just a roof overhead and that's it. The, the most basic structure that's meant to dissolve back into nature, not stand for hundreds of years. And I have a picture of um, seven Kumeyaay ladies and it was taken in 1892. Mm-hmm. And these, the youngest one of these seven is 105. Wow. And there's a lady there that's 112. Mm-hmm. And she's standing straight up with her hands on her hips. Amazing. And there's two ladies. One's 126. Mm-hmm. And the other one's 128. Wow. Amazing. And, and those are the only two that needed canes. And that's because not only did they eat healthy, Mm-hmm. Eat healthy foods, could eat acorn, wild meats. Um, wild meats are very healthy mm-hmm. as opposed to domestic meats. Right. And they had to go gather their food, which was exercise. Water. Being an elder, they probably got a lot of it delivered to them. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so they lived to be very old. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then I thought about how the education system worked. How, how 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 did how did we educate ourselves? Mm-hmm. You know, and we educate you know through our family, and 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 like I did through my grandfather, right? And that's how that was the traditional ways through your grandparents. Mm-hmm. But if your grandparents are living to be a one hundred and twenty five, you're going to have like great 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 grandparents there, right. and that's a lot of grandparents because. Because you have four grandparents, you have so eight alive, great yeah. grandparents, mm-hmm. you have sixteen great great grandparents. Wow! And so, and for every student, there was forty teachers Amazing. that loved you and cared for you and wanted the best for you. Mm-hmm. And opposed to each teacher having forty students that were kind of, you know, they're there and but they're they're gone, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, there's a lot of personal. In the traditional way, the students never leave, you know. It's, mm-hmm. it's almost 24 hours a day school. Yeah, you're living together. And, and they're all close, whereas now yeah, yeah. everyone is um, living apart from most of their relatives, I would say, you know, far from for the average person. They're not living in the same uh, vicinity of especially not multiple sets of grandparents. Yeah, and, and the ceremonies that go with it, like um, our puberty ceremonies that really separated being youth and being an adult and your responsibilities and and also your knowing what you're going to be in life. There's no doubts. You, you, this is this is the direction. You're going to be a singer. You're going to be a dancer. You're going to be a, a medicine person or a plant person or whatever. Mm-hmm. You knew by that, by that age. And, and then right. you had all those... 40 teachers, like, say, oh, I know about this plan, or I know about, you know. But you were guided to find that path, right? Mm -hmm. That was just part of the tradition. Yeah, yeah. That you had assistance in finding that path, you know, distilling it all down. You know, you speak highly of your Kumeyaay mentor, Jane Dumas. Yes. Um, How did she become your mentor around traditional plants in the Kumeyaay language? Mm, I actually was close to her sister, Jenny. Mm-hmm. And and Jenny's actually the, the lady that gave me my uh, my name. She kind of gave me a human name. But we would go out, and uh, uh, Jane would, as 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 uh, uh, Jenny would say, cause I, I'd talk about her weeds, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and I would listen to what she had to say, and I also would listen to a lot of people would come up and ask her questions afterwards. But mm-hmm. I never would. I would always just listen. Mm-hmm. And after about a year or so or two, she um, goes, oh, you're interested in plants. I go, yeah. She goes, you want to go to my mom's gathering place and help me gather? 
Uh huh. And then she gave me my first lesson. Well, you studied with her for like three continuous decades, right? Yeah, 35 years. Yeah. Amazing. To have I mean, probably in my 30s, you know. Mm -hmm. But then the language, did that come naturally as part of your learning with her? That that was just. Did that happen? Because, first of all, she would talk about plants, but no one knew what she's talking about. <laughs> like, you mean the name? She'd say, oh, talk, she'd talk about fifth thigh. No one knew what fifth thigh was, mm -hmm. you know? And, or she'd talk about lacy sage. Right. No one knew what lacy sage was. Um, and she'd talk about these plants. And what she had to say was really interesting. People weren't quite sure what plant she was talking about. Sometimes she'd bring an example and then they could kind of figure it out. But so I, I, what I did, I went back to school and took a bunch of botany. Mm -hmm. So I can say, oh, Pithai is Salvia apiana. Um, did other people do the same or was that kind of just you had that feeling that you needed to do that? I had the feeling I had to do that. I had to explain because by that time we were both talking about I was talking about Lacey Sage and I was talking about fifth thigh and I was, I needed to do it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people say that our cosmological worldviews are shaped fundamentally by language. And I wonder, do you feel that the reclaiming of language by indigenous peoples is essential to transforming our world from materialism to a nature connected life? Oh yeah, especially especially indigenous languages because our languages are reflections of our environment. Mm -hmm. But that it's reflections of our environment that the way it used to be, not apartments and street mm -hmm. and concrete, right? Concrete, yeah. That's one of the things uh, uh, we talked about um, keeping our house clean. Mm -hmm. uh, the outside was our house, and we had to keep it clean. Right. I'm yeah. kind of doing that with my little yard here, my and keeping keeping it native. And it's kind of I'm watching little things happen that I didn't think would happen. <laughs> uh, uh, someone really dug out all the mustard out of here. Oh, and right, dug it deep. Uh -huh. and, and they pulled a lot of soil up when they dug, pulled out the root. Mm -hmm. And I noticed the quail, like, are like coming in here like four or five times a day because we got into the seed bank. Yeah, and I think what they did, got it is into that into the mustard seed bank, the non-native seed bank. Mm -hmm. And if I think the more the quail eat, the less they'll to. grow next year. <laughs> <laughs> What were some of the ways that learning the Kumeyaay language has shaped who you are and how uh, you see? Well, one of the things when I first heard the language, I could hear the flow of it. Mm. There was a flow, there was a rhythm to it. One of the organizations I belong to is Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival. And we revive languages throughout California. And one of our more successful ones in Southern California is, was the Kumeyaay. Um, they went from like 25 speakers to maybe 100 speakers. And so, over how much time did that take to get to that kind of density of, you know, people who spoke the language? Not, not much time at all. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe I say no more than 20 years. Mm. And, and, and then... With the Tongva, the Shumash, and the Hachmam, they had zero speakers, and now they have. I, I mean, I don't, know, I don't quite know how many they have now, but they have several speakers now. And they, what they did was, they went through our program called Breath of Life, and they went through the archives and and listen to the tapes up at UC Berkeley mm -hmm. and work with a, a um, linguist right. to kind of piece the language together. Mm -hmm. And then they do a little project in the language. And, and it just started with that. It, it, actually, the Tongva language, the first thing that was spoken for probably 100 years was uh, they did the hokey pokey. 
<laughs> because it was simple, it was left, right. And, uh-huh. and, uh, wow. Me out it, so. How many different languages are in California itself that have been, you know, brought back in this way? Has it been quite a lot? Yeah, through the breath, of, the breath of life has probably, it's probably been twenty years. So, yeah, and it just like fo- that just focuses on we we have that every, when I say twenty years, it's every other year. So, mm-hmm. so that means it's there was ten of them. Okay, and and uh, and then the, the alternate years is um, language is life, and that's for people that have speakers are not for everybody's concerned with language right but the people are only indigenous peoples who are learning the language right they're not people who are uh not of the that particular nation we try to make we try to have it so that it's people from that tribe Mm -hmm. but if the language is really endangered and the tribe says it's okay for this person to learn because right they knew so and so you know they request you yeah. know, the tribe work, work. Right. I think exactly. Well, it's a, it's definitely an issue, isn't it? I mean, the carrying on of traditional wisdom and language, you need people who are actually carrying that in their being, you know, and, and, I, and, yeah. And when I see that in the young people, when I, when I mean young people, like the late teens or early uh-huh. 20s, mm-hmm. they become more active in their culture. And, and they have this this pride that the, they didn't have before they knew the language, right? Because no one encouraged they, them to speak. And right? they speak the language to each other now. Mm-hmm. They, when they greet each other, they so it's, it's a really good thing. I think it's like what you said—the pride, you know, and pride in the form of like a dignity, you know, in connecting with our ancestry. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people, a lot of a lot of people dream in their language mm. before they even learn it, and then learn the language and figure out what they're dreaming, dreaming about. <laughs> <laughs> right, going backwards here in retrospect. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, we're going to take a break right here, and we'll come back and speak a bit more about elders and traditional wisdom. Okay. Hey listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying Eco Justice Radio. We air every Monday at 9 a.m. on KPFT Houston and every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on KPFK Los Angeles. Stay connected by subscribing to Eco Justice Radio on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org to check out previous shows and guests and get connected with us on social media. For an extended version of this interview, as well as other benefits, we encourage you to become a member of our Patreon. Today, you are listening to Ethnobotany, Cultural Fire, and Indigenous Stewardship with host Carrie Kim and guest Payum Kawish Elder Richard Bugby, instructor of Ethnobotany and Ethnoecology at Cuyamaca College through Comiai Community College in San Diego County, California. So, you know, many of us know that these days we may have more elderly Then we have elders and that many gifted and wise elders, ones who are carrying a lot of their traditional wisdom have entered the spirit realm. And I wonder what are your thoughts about the passing on of intergenerational wisdom, especially against the backdrop of technology where youth uh, may be more drawn in that direction than they are to their traditional cultures. You know, what is, what do you feel is the best way to encourage youth back? Is it the language itself first beginning with that in order that they eventually will become elders? I think the language has a lot to do with it because once they get into the language, they get so immersed into the culture. And then it also, when you learn the language, there's certain things you start to understand mm-hmm. that you didn't understand in English. You're kind of thinking in a different perspective and um, I can't think of an example example but but there's just certain things that um, don't make sense in English but make perfect sense when you speak it in the language right or do things don't translate I mean do you feel that the languages are so different the Mm -hmm. um between the Kumeyaay and the Payunkachom or the the Kumeyaay language is actually called called uh uh E pi A or T pi A, and the Luseño language is actually called Chamtele. But in the Luseño language, is, it's just so different from the Kumeyaay language. It's just, Kumeyaay has very little grammar in it. 
Mm-hmm. You sing, you just, it's all about grammar. <laughs> and you also speak the language of the Payumchum or the Luiseño as well? I understand it pretty well. I understand uh, Tonga pretty well too. Mm-hmm. Because I lived, I lived in Topanga. Mm-hmm. There's, there was nobody to talk to in Topanga, except my wolf dogs and uh, mm-hmm. um, and the animals around there. But mm-hmm. since I was in Tongva territory, it was only right that I talked to them in Tongva. Mm-hmm. So started talking to them in Tongva. <laughs> but still, my wolf's commands, for some reason, were in Kumeyaay. Mm-hmm. And there, anybody that wanted to talk to them. To to my uh, dog at the no kumi or you've spoken about the need to further or develop a cultural burning network in Southern California, knowing that much more has been done in Northern California around cultural burning and bringing that back. Uh, what is your role with the intertribal fire stewardship, and how do you envision that this can um, be propagated down here? This with them or this these practices to be brought back. It's kind of accepted up north. Margot Robbins, uh, she's Yurok, and she did a she has this really nice video about doing cultural burns. Mm-hmm. And down here, people are very afraid of fire. It's like a, a, a scary word, right? And but I think if we can get people to follow fires. Mm. follow the devastating fires so they don't build up those at least those areas that burnt don't mm-hmm. build up fuel like, like they do mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, there, there i went i hate the, using the word fuel right we they're plants right they're living beings they're not just fuel mm-hmm. you know and, and and that's actually part of the difference between a control burn and a cultural burn a control burn sees acreage and fuel mm. and they want to decrease the amount of fuel on it on the most amount of acreage mm-hmm. on the cultural burn you're thinking about plant communities mm-hmm. and, and making that plant community healthy with a burn right and but the, approach. The, the secondary thing is it causes small fire breaks mm-hmm. and it's That's just true. not devastating ones like the control ones are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it's kind and, of like and, you, and healthy plant communities don't burn. Well, you had said for in another call that we had together about instead of land management, it's relationships with the land, and I think that kind of depicts the same kind of difference of this almost a dissociated yeah. way of talking or like a clinical way of talking about nature instead of as our relatives, as our ancestors, as living entities and beings, it's very different. And I think your use of the word relationship is really how we should be speaking, you know, not management. That that word has always just stuck, stuck me. I don't know. I find it very uh, disturbing. <laughs> yeah, I did too. I did. But, but that's what, that's what it came out as, as Indian land management and uh, right, Indian land management, and it like a weird bureaucracy, and just it's it's control. It sounds like control. That's what it yeah. sounds like. And I know the people that put those out, but and they meant no harm, and that's yeah. just the way they think. Yeah, but it's that kind. It's of... not a management thing; it's a relationship. Because mm-hmm. whatever whatever we did to the plants, whatever benefit we gave to the plants, or or. or they gave it back to us or whatever they gave to us, we gave it back. And it was just beneficial, you know, and, and we'll watch like the animals that chew up, they eat the plants. Mm-hmm. Our, our native animals are our browsers. They trim the plants. They, mm-hmm. they, they stimulate growth mm-hmm. and, and, and they're not grazers, which, you know, destroy the growth. Right. You know, could you explain what the role of an ethnobotanist is? I don't know. <laughs> I was just a plant guy, and <laughs> I, I hope it's the one of the things is people like to put in gardens because I don't know why they just I have this, all this stuff outside right now, but but um, they want to put in gardens, and then they want to put in ethnobotanical gardens. Mm-hmm. An ethnobotanical garden means. You gather in it. Mm. You, you 
you, you take the benefit from those plants and, the, and then return benefit those plants. And that's ethnobotanical garden. What they want to do is they want to grow the plant and say, oh, look, that's a pretty plant there. And just look at it. Right. Oh, that's, that's not an ethnobotanical garden. That's a botanical garden. Got but it. There's no ethno in it. Uh, there's no sort of relationship that's happening. There's no relationship going, yes. In that way, like where you're harvesting and then you grow and, and you, yeah, it's a different kind of relationship. And, and, and it's not always just a physical one. It's, it's a spiritual one, you know. Mm-hmm. We have songs for gathering different, you know, mm-hmm. different mm-hmm. plants. There's ceremony for this. And, and then the, what plants are used in ceremony. Mm-hmm. And then I'm sure you have different growing traditions. I mean, do you have growing traditions around the moon cycles and, you know, things yeah. like that that are very specific? Some are, some, most plants are, are on a lunar cycle. Mm-hmm. Some are on a solar cycle, like deer grass for the stalks for the basketry. You gather mm-hmm. those in the fall. Mm-hmm. And, and some of them, things you gather in the fall, some willows and stuff. Mm-hmm. But most everything's uh, um, on the full moon. Mm. And then with with non native plants, it's it's usually after a rain. Mm-hmm. They don't they don't care about the thunder moon. <laughs> they don't belong there anyway. <laughs> what is your feeling being ethnobotanist? What what is your feeling around this conversation around native non native and as far as plants are concerned? You know, because that can become very div- divisive also, where people become very extreme in their views about. Everything you say that's mo- non-native, and you know, I, I I wonder what you have to say about that. My teacher um, uh, uh, Jane, she she had no concept of native, non-native. She mm-hmm. knew what her mom used and what her mom didn't use, like ikakush. Ikakush is eucalyptus. Mm-hmm. It means a tall tree, but <laughs> yeah. And, uh, okay. Was there another one? She oh, mustas. Which is the, the kind of the, the most invasive plant we have, which is mustard. Uh huh. But they love it. The mm-hmm. elders love that plant. I mean, she one time asked the ranger if she could have some mustard that was growing on the hillside. He said, Yeah, take all you want. He, she couldn't believe it. He's so generous. <laughs> uh, were they eating it? I mean, is that what they were doing with that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What she did was she would parboil it and put it in. Serving size baggies and freeze them and mm. and pull them out and she had her <laughs> own fr- frozen foods section. <laughs> of now I wanted to ask you. There's been a lot of consternation over the word science, especially the last couple of years, and I feel that science has become divorced from spirituality over human time. Um, do you feel that these are mutually exclusive terms, and does science have a role? in indigenous life ways? Well, to me, science is trial and error Mm -hmm. until they get it right. (laughs) But we've done all that trial and error already. Mm -hmm. And we got it right. We don't, you know, if if you take a plant and you have to cook it three times (laughs) to get the bitterness out, you you must know what you're doing because I would have gave up after the, Actually, probably after the first time. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I do think they can work hand in hand, though. I think the problem is when we make science separate from spirituality instead of it being something spiritual as well. You know, whether you could call it alchemy, and all of a sudden that changes the way we think about it. What's the difference really between something alchemical or something, you know, or science? You know, we've made it these terms. And I don't know. I mean, I guess also at a certain point, the way we think about science, when does science or academic kind of learning, that becomes a hindrance to learning, right? So there's some kind of a fine balance too. You know, you know, cause I, I co-teach with a, a scientist mm-hmm. and, and she's a, an actual botanist. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes when she's talking, I go, Oh yeah, that's in our creation story. Uh-huh. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> talking about uh, basic <laughs> life. And I go, I go, uh, what, what is pond scum? She goes, oh, that's algae. I go, hey, that's in our creation story. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the first things created. Mm-hmm. You know, it makes sense. Well, it's one of the first <laughs> life forms. So. Yes, yes. What would you like to say about fire and the notion of droughts 
in California, you know, what do you say are the common misperceptions and the truths about both? You know, I had the, my PowerPoint and, and for a long time, it says the results of fire. And one of it said increases water. Mm. And I go, oh, that must be a mistake. <laughs> oh, that must be a mistake. But it's not a mistake. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a, a, what they found, a mono. One of the guys I work with, State Parks uh, Advisor Group, uh, uh, Ron Good. Okay. Anyway, they did these little burns in their in, in Mono Country, southern mm-hmm. Mewa, uh, southern uh, Sierras, mm-hmm. and they noticed that after the burns, native grasses started or native plants started coming up, and and the water table started rising, and the little creek started flowing again. Mm-hmm. And what it was was the plants after the burn. The plants that got burned away were plants that were sucking water up. Mm-hmm. And the plants that got replaced were plants that would, were holding, holding water, water in the roots. Mm-hmm. And so it was actually pulling the water table up. Mm-hmm. Replenishing your, your aquifer is a pretty good way to <laughs> help with a drought. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, nature's brilliance, right? So it's already built in. Yeah, right we never, we never start our water on the on the outside. We always started on the inside and had all these cool springs that would bubble it up to us. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, you mentioned being a former member of the Native American Council for California State Parks, and you know, I was wondering if you could speak about how this council interacted with the state parks and what kind of impact it had on how they're run. We know that the kind of sordid history of state parks that many were, you know, they're on stolen land. They're uh, involved a lot of forced displacement of indigenous peoples, but being on that council, what, what was the aim of the council and what, what was achieved? Do you feel? It was dissolved and Wilson became governor. He dissolved all uh, ethnic groups, Mm -hmm. groups. But when it was still there, we were an advisor to the director himself. Mm-hmm. And, and, and uh, there was, I think there were six of us. Two from the that. north, two from the uh-huh. center, and two from the south. Right. And no, there was three of us. I mean, we was, uh-huh. we was in the center. We were pretty effective. One of the ladies was Vivian Hailstone. And her and I put together a basket weavers gathering permit for state parks mm. where elders can actually have young people gather for them. And mm. it, it's a really good uh, permit. Um, I applied I mean, for it twice and I got denied twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the hope is not only that it would come back, but actually more that there be the return of state park land to indigenous peoples. I think that's yeah, I think that would be what we'd be calling now. I think the other big thing that we did was uh, before Native Rangers weren't allowed to have their hair long. Mm. And then we made that to they can have their hair long. Yeah. But I think nowadays returning land to certain tribes would be um, what the uh, state park should do. Yes, definitely. I have a problem. Sometimes they think that it's their land. Mm-hmm. And, and actually, they're actually hold, I guess, holding it for the people. I don't know what they're doing, but <laughs> it's, land. It, it's, you know, it's whoever's tribe it is. Mm-hmm. And then we have these tribes, the Hashemun people, the Tongva people that, that would um, love to have a piece of land, of course, of a, of their, a, a piece of their own land. Mm-hmm. And, and because it and, belongs to them. I mean, rightfully yeah, so. But, it, you know, at the, at the, at the very least, Make them the managers of that mm-hmm. of that park. Make that tribe the manager. And that's I, I I work a lot with Australian Aboriginals, mm-hmm. and that's what they're starting to do with the national mm-hmm. park. That's wonderful. It, it, it's is put uh, cultural leaders in in, in in certain tribes as the as the, the leaders in these different parks. Mm-hmm. 
to determine how it runs. I feel that momentum, it's kind of like the hundredth monkey effect because it is happening in little parts around the world. And as it just continues gaining momentum, it's just, it is what's, what's happening because it's what's right. You know, it's kind of what's meant for our times is that the lands return to the original stewards. That's what's going to bring health back to this planet. You know, because, you know right right now, um, my cousin, he has this piece of land in Palmer Reservation mm-hmm. up in Mount Palomar. Okay. And he says he doesn't use any science, but he uses science. He, <laughs> he, 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 uh, he also prays a lot about what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Is he what he should be doing? Right. And he's just doing this wonderful job at, at Palomar, just re- really opening up meadows and pastures, mm. and, mm. and 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 you can sit up there and and and, oh, and, and tapping up onto springs and right. and having these pools that run down. The, it's just really nice. You see. And you can like see the open area. You can see deer running around. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. And you can see mountain lions hunting the oh. deer. It's like, oh, it's wow. just so cool. Uh-huh. And, and um, um, yeah, but he's yeah. just relying on, to me, g- genetic memory mm-hmm. of how he was supposed to be doing it. Because mm-hmm. he, had, you know, is. It was originally my uh, my uh, great uncle's uh, land. Okay. And then that was uh, uh, it was my cousin's father. Well, maybe my cousin too, but his father he got attached to that piece of land, started taking care of it, and then he started t- taking care of it. He goes, and I go now, now, now that mountain has you, mm-hmm. and but he goes. Yeah, but that's not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, we're going to take another break here. And we want to talk a little bit about you and the Californian Indian Basket Weavers Association. Be right back. Hey, listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying Eco Justice Radio. We air every Monday at 9 a.m. on KPFT Houston and every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on KPFK Los Angeles. Stay connected by subscribing to Eco Justice Radio on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org, to check out previous shows and guests and get connected with us on social media. For an extended version of this interview, as well as other benefits, we encourage you to become a member of our Patreon. Today, you are listening to Ethnobotany, Cultural Fire, and Indigenous Stewardship with host Carrie Kim and guest Payum Kawish Elder Richard Bugby, instructor of Ethnobotany and Ethnoecology at Cuyamaca College through Komiai Community College in San Diego County, California. So, Richard, being a member of the California Indian Basket Weavers Association, you know, I wanted to say it saddens me when I hear of the stories like we've talked about with the Tongva and just other indigenous peoples who may no longer have access to their traditional materials, whether it be for basket weaving or other practices or part of their material culture. And I wonder how you feel that this could change. I know we talk about uh, returning state parks to the native peoples to whom they really rightfully and ancestrally belong. I don't know if you had any other comments on this. The hardest part about weaving basket, baskets are hard to weave. But the, <laughs> the, hard, the harder part of, of weaving the basket is going and gathering the material. <laughs> right. And, and prepping the material like a year before you mm-hmm. gather it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And, um, and knowing where there is some material because... With all this concrete and asphalt, it's, it's getting scarce. Mm-hmm. And, and there's some that grows better than others. Well, it makes me think about the project that you and Lacey Boyer Cannon done at Indigenous Regeneration, how you did the kind of restored those materials for basket weaving, right? Yeah. Well, 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 well. I used to work at the Museum of Man in San Diego. Mm-hmm. Now it's the Museum of Us. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I can always recognize baskets made in San Isabel. Mm. And it's because the juncus grow really close to the oaks and, and the red in the juncus. Oh, was still, uh, the way it comes out. Yeah. was redder. Mm-hmm. And, and so I was thinking there was a bunch of oaks at um, one farming place. Mm-hmm. And I was going to put berms around the 
the drip lines and then Ooh. plant juncus in those uh-huh. firms so they get the nice red uh-huh. and then and take that there's going to be a um, like a produce stand uh-huh but th- there's a lot of reservations and tribes there so i was going to put basket juncus and basket weaving material there for tribal members to purchase instead of have to go gather and mm. and we can kind of grow them on the farm like that. Right. It's right. kind of funny because they're planning these these things and they go, oh yeah, this has a, a 30 day turnaround. And uh-huh. This has a 60 day turnaround. I mean, then the time they it goes into something you can eat. Right. And so I was planting a, a, a black oak and I go, this has a 60 year turnaround. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's so funny <laughs> because modern human beings especially western human beings have has pretty much largely failed to protect mother nature do you feel that the rights that rights need to or should be established for nature i mean i know that that's been a movement that's been happening in several different countries you know whether new zealand australia colombia ecuador people you know bangladesh india they've all had some instances of where they've protected, say, a river as a living entity and and different things like this. I mean, what do you feel about that? I mean, obviously, if we were uh, more living as the indigenous peoples did, this wouldn't be necessary. But given that destruction continues to happen, do you think this is something that should be done? It's something that didn't. It shouldn't even need to be done. I agree with you. No, but but yeah, for people that don't understand, Yes. Like it's uh, a step in the right direction to, I mean, it's like, yeah, just yeah like stop, I mean, stop the bleeding and in, in kind of the sense, you know, it, like, like I, I'm saying, when they do these burns, they say, oh, fuel, even though I said fuel, and it's not fuel, they're living beings. Plants mm-hmm. are living beings. They just can't run or, <laughs> but they do think. Right. And they do and they, and they do communicate with each other. And they do a lot of things, and they can uh, they can do a lot of things we can't do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, hundred percent. Would you t- speak about your involvement with land conversation and what land conversation is doing? I remember I did a well, will, all willow project with them. We um, cut down willows and see if they grew better, knocked down or or uh, upright. <laughs> And then and then, it was like, and, but it was uh, taken over by the wood rats. Oh. And they t- made it a wood rat condominium. So what did you find? It was better. Which way? The willow grew straighter and, and better. The trees knocked over. It's knocked over. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you are also a member of the Elder Circle for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I was wondering when you were a part of that. What were some of the ways that the Elder Circle was able to influence the service? Um, <laughs> well, well, you know what they they brought. Actually, that was when I was I was kind of younger then. No, I mean, I wasn't. I think I was maybe in my fifties. But that's right when the fish and wildlife people realized that plants had something to do with their fish and wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> Light bulb, right? <laughs> and that they should get some advice about, and that's how uh, me and my teacher ended up being on that on that thing. Mm. And I, because I remember my teacher was um, pretty elderly by the time we were on that council. Mm-hmm. But are you finding also for yourself and in what you do, are there more people? Do you find that there's more people seeking after you for that? for the wisdom that you hold or the plant wisdom that you, the knowledge that you have, has it changed? Yeah, there, there was a time where I kind of stopped teaching and, and, but then I thought it wasn't fair to my teacher. Mm. That if I stopped teaching them, why, why right. she teach me? Right. There's you know, a great I have thing. to, I have to teach as many people as I can. Right. That's just kind of the, um, the reciprocity, isn't it? For what? Yeah. And, and 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 I and actually I teach at Kumia Community College there, right? And and that gives me a good outlet, and 
and I get the mess with science because I, like I said, my other teacher is a scientist. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. But I love what you said about science being trial and error because that's a, it's a good way to look at it, you know, and it's accurate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the way, that's the way things work with scientific things. Is. Given the risk of extinction for much of the flora and fauna around the world, whether we're talking in here in California, whether we're talking about the Chinook salmon and, and up in Washington, the orca whales to Joshua trees, what message do you wish to impart to the youth of the world? I think one of the things, when I lived in Australia, one of the things I noticed is they watched the world and they were saying, save the rainforest. And I go, oh, you care about the, the rainforest in South America? And they go, no, save our rainforest, you know, mm-hmm. and because they would solve that other rainforest. And, and I I just see everybody just working together. Well, I would say that the fate of all peoples is tied together in our times. It's really the only way forward is unity. Uh, around a you know a much larger cause than ourselves, and I wonder if you feel that traditional ecological knowledge really needs to be shared more widely. Oh, techies! <laughs> or, I don't know whatever word you would want to say for that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, that's what that's what it is, <laughs> and and it's okay because that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. Because of the breaks that so many people have had with their ancestral wisdom, because even if we say, oh, all people are indigenous to the land from somewhere, but most people, there's a break in that connection and they no longer know how to grow. They no longer know what are their, you know, the traditions from the plants of their region from where they come from originally. Yeah, we have a farm next door Mm -hmm. and I saw this little toddler come through and she jerked on these green things and pulled out a couple of carrots or a carrot and her mom came by and rinsed it off and the little kid ate that carrot, you know? And I thought that kid's going to always know where food comes from mm. because when I worked at the museum of man, kids thought meat came from a styrofoam tray with clear plastic over it. And that's where meat came up. They had no idea it was an animal. And, and, and I taught my little grandkids, and he's eating some bacon and he comes down and goes, Grandpa, I'm eating a cow. I go, Well, you're close. It's a pig. <laughs> and, and so he turns around and his brother's, his older brother's right there. He goes, Ryan, I'm eating a pig. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, he got it. Right. Well, it, it's true. I mean, given the fact that, you know, so many, uh, so much of our youth these days, they don't cook for themselves. I mean, most of it's like, food delivery or something prepackaged, I mean, more so than ever before. And this is global. Yeah. And, and, and uh, it's just kids think that uh, food is, it comes from a grocery store. You and know? they don't know how to it grow is, uh, food. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's that whole part about how we used to live outdoors. Like that was more of our life. You know, when I, I think of these um, makeover shows, of yeah. something I'm like that should actually be shows in nature there shouldn't be any show about a house and remaking a house yeah. <laughs> because it doesn't matter in the end you know that's what's uh, not going to save your life in the end you know when you don't have food or water or that I'm house. in a little unique I'm in a concrete house that's embedded into the side of the hill oh it's kind of strange <laughs> Did you build it that way? <laughs> no, I didn't build it at all. <laughs> that's where I live in. It's, uh, it's pretty nice. <laughs> it's like a 2,500 acre front yard. Mm-hmm. You know, looking back on your life of learning about plants and traditional life ways, all the things that you've done in your life and seen, what advice would you like to give to modern people because they are living in this unprecedented, troubled, but also auspicious time. You know, it's not all doom and gloom. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I live in this space that I'm kind of back in time where I can, I'm a heroine with nature. And, and when I visit the 
like like I gotta go up to UCLA for a couple of days, and I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of <laughs> yeah. It's like I, I gotta <laughs> sit in the city for like <laughs> three days. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to land. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But um, I lived in Topanga for 25 years, which is not really the city either. But I remember looking into the San Fernando Valley from up from Topanga, but and just looking at that valley. And, and erasing all the trees and the and the houses, I had to erase the trees because most of them are not native. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. But but it didn't say. Oh, I bet your bears roamed over these hills and mm. and, and just kind of put it back. Uh, yeah, there's a permaculturist that we interviewed on the show, Warren Brush, and one of the things he said is he uh, when he comes to the city, he touches concrete and then tells tells the concrete there you know i remember you river that this is like a way that helps him to be in the city instead of thinking of it as concrete yeah yeah because it is it is hard to be in the city for sure especially for someone who's lived so close to nature as you have and it's and it's so different from you know um la's river is the concrete river and san diego's the rivers Still mm-hmm. a regular river. I mean, it's still got willows and cottonwoods. And oh, I can only imagine. Looks like a river. Yeah, like the it's just, it's just lined with hotel room, uh, hotels. That's oh all. gosh, right. Oh geez, you know. Aside from the obvious of returning native lands to native peoples and seeing more and more of that globally, what would you like to see in your lifetime? You, you know, I really think they're going to get the land back. Mm-hmm. You know, you think besides that. Mm-hmm. When, when I used to hang around with the elders, they used to say, when we get the land back, we're going to do this. When we get the land back, we're going to do that. And I thought, they're never going to get the land back. But then I also thought, oh, we need to do fires. Oh, they're never going to let us do fires. But they're starting to let us do fires. There's things happening, yes, little by little by little it's happening. And and I think the difference is, too, when it's happening globally with Indigenous peoples in various parts of the globe, that that makes this um, exponential momentum in that direction. It is like that hundredth, hundredth monkey effect. And, 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 and I think as Indigenous people, we're really feeling our, our ties to the land and how we're connected to the land. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what do you want to say also about, you know, indigenous peoples and reconnecting to their native foods? Because that just as we talk about the language, the same thing is what's going into the body and then making the thoughts and the consciousness. You know, that cycle is so important, you know, given all the the devastation around food that was intentional. Right. Kind of all the extermination campaigns. What do you say about that part of the food cycle and decolonizing food and the importance of that. One of the things I was the editor for, I think it was called Indians of Southern California with the emphasis on the Kumeyaay. Mm -hmm. And in the, in this booklet, it said acorns were the main food of the Kumeyaay. Mm -hmm. And I said, I guess acorns were the main food. It sounds good to me. (laughs) And, and, And the other elders came down on me and said, why did you let that pass? I go, <laughs> I go, it's not our main food. And they go, no. <laughs> I go, what's our main food? And they go, meat. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, well, here's a food that we go up once. We have it like two weeks out the whole year to gather. We mm-hmm. take our whole tribe up to gather it. Right. We get enough for the whole year uh-huh. to eat every day for every meal. Right. And he said, this is not our main food. This is our staple food. Uh-huh. This is like beans or rice or potatoes. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and I, I go, what's our main food? They go, meat. Mm-hmm. And, and But native, uh, wild meat is very high in protein, mm-hmm. but there's not enough fat in it to maintain your body. Mm-hmm. And what what is really good fat is the acorn. Acorn. So those two and things. And the acorn is always eaten with the meat. Right. And um, um and then and then I come to realize that our food is all about supplements. 
Mm -hmm. because we didn't drink milk. And from the time you're weaned from your mom until you're an adult, your bones are really growing. Mm -hmm. And so what builds better bones? Powdered bone. We mm. crush up the bones of small wow. animals and put it in our food. Ah. Um, and so would we they knew. Would they boil soup or would they just, uh, you know, how would they digest that? It, it'd be all on a stew and everything okay. be eaten, eaten in, in a stew. Mm -hmm. Very few, very little food was eat, eaten raw. Right. And so it was a bunch of nutrients about, mm -hmm. because food wasn't thought up as so much as food as medicine to maintain your body right and i think that's one probably another reason why we live to be so long richard could you explain how you know how listeners can be in contact with you and i know you uh, offer a lot of the teaching around cultural programs down where you are on kumiai lands and if you could just explain a little bit about how you know some of your contact info oh, okay well, like my email? Yeah, or wh however listeners could find out more about well, you. Yeah, it's uh, it's Hunwut, or H-U-N-W-U-T, at AOL.com. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't changed that one for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so is that the best way for listeners to contact you is through that? Yeah, because if you, if you, if you, if you call me on your phone, at the phone, I just see numbers. <laughs> see many phone calls <laughs> Richard thank you so much for all the many years of your devotion to the plants to your heritage to reclaiming the language and then helping others do the same you truly are a, a treasure you know and and truly an elder in that regard you know because you're passing it on and and uh, really feel that as a responsibility to future generations and we thank you for that well, thank you Thank you to our guest, Payum Kawish Elder Richard Bugby, and thank you to our listeners for joining us. This has been Ethnobotany, Cultural Fire, and Indigenous Stewardship. For extended versions of our interviews, become a member of our Patreon. Please connect with us on social media at Eco Justice Radio, SoCal 350, and Adventures in Waste. If you like what you heard today and you want others to be informed, you know what to do. Subscribe to our podcast, share the episodes, and help us continue our efforts by joining our Patreon or making a donation to the show. been listening to eco justice radio a project of socal 350 the show can be heard on kpfk.org kpft.org all major podcast apps and at ecojusticeradio.org created by mark and jp morris executive producer jack Eit, producer and co-host jessica aldridge co-host carrie kim and engineer and original music by blake quake beats and until next time remember the power is yours <laughs>